We're in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, to get to Hebrews chapter 6, you've got to go through 5.11, 5.10, Jesus is a priest designated according to the order of Melchizedek, 5.11. Concerning him, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. We want to talk about this guy, but you can't handle the truth. Chapter 6, verse 1. Let's leave the elementary teaching of Christ. Let's press on, he says. Verse 3. This we will do if God permits. You, you mean he might not permit it? Yes, he might not permit it. That's 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> In some situations, the Lord will not permit this person who was once a Christian to continue, if you will. Verse 9, but, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. So, he writes this letter to them and says, look, right now you're not maturing. But we're convinced that God will work with you and allow you to mature. Why? Verse 10, we've already covered all this material. Verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and love, which you have shown toward his name, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. In Hebrews, their situation is they're giving up their faith in Jesus Christ, and they're thinking about returning to the law of Moses and all that that involves. And he says, no, don't give up your faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way to salvation. Now notice... They were ministering. To, they had been ministering to the saints, and they still will, still, still work. They were showing love. They were working. And so we understand from this text that just showing love to saints, just working, is not enough. You also have to believe in salvation in Jesus Christ. Notice in chapter, 11, chapter 5, he had said, look, you guys are coming dull of hearing. And there's a chance that the Lord might not continue to let this, this develop and go on. Verse 9 of chapter 6, he says, but we are convinced of better things to you for you because God is not so unjust to forget your work. Somebody wrote, God, even, even among your errors, will not overlook signs of grace working in you. Thank God for his grace, because I know I make a lot of errors, but God still is willing to work with me. Is that a translation? Or is oh, no, that's just a comment. A comment. Okay. Yeah. Chapter 6, verse 9. We are convinced of better things for you. Verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Okay, so verse 9, we're convinced of better things of you. Verse 11, we need you to keep on keeping on. You know that diligence you're showing and doing good works for your saints and, and showing love to each other? The, the same diligence you apply toward that, you need to apply towards having faith in Jesus Christ. We desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to... Realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Our hope is laid up for us in heaven. Colossians chapter 1 verse 5. Colossians 1 verse 5. The hope laid up for you in heaven. Of which you previously heard in the word of truth. So this word comes and tells us and says, hey, look. There's hope for you laid up in heaven. The way you get to that hope is by diligently putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, you've got to continue your faith in Jesus Christ in order to realize that hope that is now waiting for you in heaven. Verse 11. We desire that each one of you, and the, the finger points to every single person with that, with that word each there, each one of you and me show the same diligence because we can't write on the coattails of somebody else's face, right? So as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that there will be two results of their being diligent. You need to be diligent in your faith in Jesus Christ. So that, two results, you will, number one, not be sluggish. 
That's the same word in chapter 5, verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 11. Concerning him we have had to say, much to say, it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. If you don't want to be dull of hearing, you've got to show faith in Jesus Christ. So in chapter 6, 11. Be diligent. Verse 12. So that you will not be sluggish, that's the negative, but you will be imitators or mimickers, here's the second result of being diligent, of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Example number one. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. That word having patiently waited. That's one word. Here's the fun technical part. That's a modal principle. It's the use of a participle to express the condition or mode of the agent which affects the partic particular action. What does that mean? The action is he obtained the promise. The circumstances which led to him obtaining the promise is he patiently waited. You want the promise? You've got to patiently wait for it. So there is the way, okay? There's the way. The question is, how did Abraham get to where he was going? The way is two parts. Two parts. One part works and love. Right? I think that's verse 7. Uh, maybe I forget what verse it is right there. The second part, faith in God. And for us, Abraham didn't have to believe in Jesus. He had to believe in God. This is Romans 4. We have to believe in Jesus. Because God says, now you believe in me. And I'm telling you to believe in Jesus. So the way requires works and love, faith in God, and persistence. Persistence in both. Who wants to go to where Abraham is? That's the way to do it. You've got to be persistent in your faith that Jesus Christ is the path of salvation and in your obedience to everything that he says and his grace and his mercy when you make a mistake. Right? Okay. Anybody, this is a full text, so I'm sure that somebody else has a thought. I don't want to domineer and take up the whole class. So we've got to keep on keeping on. That's the short of it. We've got to keep on keeping on. Number one, you've got to keep on doing the work. Keep on doing the work. Can you think of a passage that says something like, do not grow weary of? I received a phone call this week. Here's the summary of it. A man and a wife are going through a difficult time in their marriage. They have been for years and they keep coming to us. And it takes up all of our Sunday. It takes up all of our midweek meeting, meeting day. And on the phone, we spend hours and hours and hours. And we are exhausted. Yeah. Galatians 6. Do not grow weary of doing good. Don't do it. How about the faith part? In... Luke chapter 18, you remember the, the widow pounds on the door of the unrighteous judge. Now it's an analogy, God is not unrighteous, but the end of it is, if that widow, the story is the widow kept pounding, kept pounding, kept pounding, kept pounding. If she had quit, she never would have gotten what she wanted. That's the point. And it ends with this, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Because some people will have given up. God didn't answer me when I wanted, the way I wanted. And I prayed for years for this thing. And I just stopped praying. That seems to be their situation. Or real close to it. Maybe they're focusing on something that, they, that they're not focusing on. And God, when you have the troubles with people and things like that, 
Yeah. And if this by Tom, Dick, and Harry. Right. We, we don't concentrate on the negative in our life. That means we don't ignore it. That doesn't mean we ignore it. Thank you. But, yeah, we, I mean, things, guess what, guys? Life happens, right? <laughs> That's why we're here. God set it up so that we'd be occasionally annoyed. And it's how we handle this kind of abuse, right? So we've got to keep on keeping on in both our obedience and our faith and our faith. There's a threat that we might discontinue our work of love and our faith. There's a threat we might discontinue that. That's what this whole book is about. Can you think of a certain situation that the Lord gives us in order to counter the threat of no longer working the works of love? You've got to keep on working in love. And so he gives us an environment, right? Hebrews chapter 10. Let us consider, verse 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good works, not forsaking our own assembling together. Why do we go to church? So that, among other reasons, we encourage each other. How about a situation the Lord will give us? Look, you might give up your faith. There's a threat that you will give up your faith. Can you think of something the Lord gives us to help us not give up our faith? Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brethren, verse 12, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day. So we get together. Whatever it takes. My brother is, he's in peril. I've, I've got to go help him. I'm, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling. I'm not, no, I still believe. I'm just not doing the works I ought to. God gives us these tools to help us avoid the pitfalls. George Bosworth? This really shows the, the, um, the, the concept of God just wants me to be happy for what it is. Do not grow weary of doing good works. Is but if means you can grow weary is the thing. And, the, and the be happy again. Right, right. The happiness is, is, that is true. He does. But he's defined it already for us, and he's shown us how already. So by the time we're saying, but <laughs> God just wants us to be happy, we, we've really lost track of, right. of his expectations. Yeah, he also gives us a glimpse of hell and a glimpse of heaven. Yeah. Yeah. All in this book, too. Here. The, the writer has stressed in the previous chapter before he gets to Abraham the importance of faith. Yeah. What made Abraham work? Faith. Yeah. Right. So, they, you know, don't be like those who fell away by unbelief. Yeah. Have a strong faith. A strong faith. Abraham had a strong faith. I will show you my faith by my works, James 2. Right? Which, means, which means the works were necessary, just, not just in terms of what, the, what it got him, but the fact is the work wouldn't be necessary if he hadn't put challenges in front of Abraham. Uh -huh. Life is not easy. So, yes, the faith motivates us to the work, but the work only is necessary because life is difficult. Yeah. Um, did you notice that people usually lose their faith before they stopped behaving as though they are faithful. They're still doing their works, but they're struggling with their faith because the tradition of our habits is a whole lot more difficult to lose than the original motivation for those habits. I got into this good habit because I had faith in God. And I keep on this good habit, I keep on this good habit, I keep on this good habit, and meanwhile my faith is going down because I'm not maintaining it, but I still keep on this good habit. And next thing you know, you've got somebody who looks like they're faithful, but they're not. It said in verse 11, we desire that you show diligence. Verse 12, two outcomes. Two results. One, you not be sluggish. Number two, you be imitators of those who, and I'll just skip to the end, inherit the promises. Be imitators of those who inherit the promises. 
So is that my goal, just to imitate? Come again. Richie, thank you. <laughs> That's what happens, guys. Sorry. <laughs> so here's Richie. I know he's faithful. That's my goal, just imitate Richie. It's not the end goal, is it? It's not the end goal. Oh, just, you know, you, here's this brother. Let's, let's, let's consider the sister over here. She's, she's, look, she's God. You, you look at her. She is a Sarah. She is a Phoebe. You need to be like her. True? Yes, you absolutely need to be like her. But is that the end goal? Just be like, no. The point is, Paul says, look, observe those who walk after the way I walk. Observe those who walk after the way I walk. So anybody who walks like Paul walked, we observe. And we model ourselves after that kind of behavior. Why? Just to be like Ethan? I want to be like Ethan. No. Now, I might, I might think to myself, I need to be more like Ethan. But the idea is, who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises? That's the end goal. Right there. We're, we're trying to model the things that are good about that person because they're good at modeling Christ. Right. And that's the, yep. that's the goal. Of it. It's just easier to see sometimes that a person that's in front of you right. to recognize that. I was privy to a conversation. A worker was working with the congregation. This worker had this one, I don't want to say hobby, this fault he identified with the congregation. And he said, you, you need to do this, you need to do this. And the whole congregation said, you just want us to be like you. And his reply was excellent. It was, as long as I'm walking like Christ, yes. Right? That, no, I don't want you to be like me. We need to walk like they walk. He walked. This word mimic or imitators, the word in my version is imitators in verse 11. Be not sluggish, be imitators. The word, if you see the original, it looks like mimic. You, you'll get, and we understand the word mimic. It's used six times in the New Testament. Here's one. First or second, excuse me, first Thessalonians chapter two. First Thessalonians two, verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. For, here's, here, look, we're thankful because you received it. How do you know you received it? Brethren, you became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ, which are in Judea, for you also endured the same hardship in hands of your own countrymen. So they endured persecution over in Thessalonica, just like they endured persecution back in Judea. And the Lord's, and the reason is, is because they accepted the gospel, and the Lord says, look, you've mimicked them, and that's a good thing. They're enduring hardship because they have chosen to follow me. There's one of the mimic passages. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 6. Oops. First. 1 Thessalonians 1 and 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so not only did they mimic the churches, but they also mimicked Paul and they also mimicked the Lord in that they were persecuted, but not just persecuted, they were persecuted with much joy. While they're going through the per persecution, I mean, I'm tempted to grumble my way all the way through it. When I do that, I'm mimicking them in that I'm being persecuted, but I am not mimicking them in grumbling my way all the way through it. And that's not to be our attitude. Ephesians 5. <laughs> uh, this one is kind of broad. Ephesians 5, 1. Be imitators of God. <laughs> right. Verse 2, walk in love, just as Christ loved you. Okay, so, oh, by the way, how did Christ love people? Was, was his love some subjective, oh, I think this is love in this situation, and that's love in that situation? How do we know what love is? Uh, yes, okay, right. We look at his example, 
But if you were to define love, and I don't actually mean this technically as a, a definition. Say. Uh, gave himself up for us and offering sacrifice for God as a Right. That is the potential. We might have, that's 1 John 3. 1 John 3. You might have to love somebody so much that you give your life up for That is the potential of love. The probable is more like 1 John 5, the same 1 John 3. Look, whoever sees his brother in need and has the goods to help him but doesn't, that's more like what we are. You know, Not often am I called on to, in fact, I don't think I ever have been, to die for somebody. But people have come up to me often and said, I, I need help. Well, I better share with them. You, you have a yeah, point. Uh, you know, right along with what you're saying, what, you know, when you say we love God, you know, what's that mean to love God? First God, God. You, say, you, know, you know, this is the love of God that we keep. His, his commandment, you Pharisee. Yeah. You're too conservative. <laughs> you're too literal. You're, too, you're following the letter of the law. I'm a legalist, right? You're a legalist. So, I, I know. Thank you. Just like who? Jesus Christ. Now, he did it exactly what God said so that people would know he loved the Father. This is John 12, right? Right. He, he, why? No, Jesus wasn't running around saying, okay, this is check, 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 check. And that's it. He was running around saying, check, check, check. But I'm checking these boxes because I love God. And this is what he wants from me. And whatever he wants, because I love him, I'll do it. So we need to have a checklist mentality coupled with, not like the Pharisees, not like those Jews who were just like, I, if I do this, I'm in. No, we need to have it because we love the Lord. Here's one, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is the last time this verse, this, uh, no, actually, it's, well, yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 16. I exhort you, Im be imitators or mimickers of me. For this reason I have sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach in everywhere in every church. And here's one example of one of those things. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11. 1. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be imitators of me. And the first thing, oh, then he goes on to say, I praise you because you remember and everything and hold to the traditions just as I traditioned them to you. And the first thing he talks about is this covering for the woman. Whatever you define the covering as, that's the first thing he talks about. The second thing he talks about is, verse 23, the Lord's Supper. I received from the Lord that which I also traditioned to you. And then he talks about the Lord's Supper. So the... Worship, what we do as a congregation together, is also determining whether or not we are mimicking Paul, whose ways are in Jesus Christ. So it matters what a congregation does as a congregation. Comments or questions on this? So the question is, why should we? Why should we put in all this work? Diligent mimicking. Why? Well. He'll answer. No. Hebrews 6, verse 16. 4. Okay, understand that I skimmed over 13 and 14. I did that on purpose because the author himself goes back to it right now. So 13, God made the promise to Abraham. So this is Genesis 22. Since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. The author is now going to backtrack to this. He's going to expound on it. He's going to emphasize God is faithful. And the reason, the purpose of all this backtracking, expounding, and emphasizing is so that we have more confidence in our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 16. Why should we mimic? Why should we? Do, why should we do all this diligence? Men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation as the end of every dispute. It's the end. Do you really mean it? 
And they would say, yes, I swear. Okay, I'm done. I, I, I take a solemn vow that I mean it. And we understand everywhere the conversation is over. Now, he might be lying. But still, the impact is the conversation is done. This is what he has said. Verse 17, in the same way, so just like men, and here's another example of God coming down, stooping down to our level to help us. In the same way as men and every dispute with an oath, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of his promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. So he, he did it too, just like man says, I solemnly vow, and that's the end. You can believe it. I solemnly vow. God says, I solemnly vow, and you can believe it. So that, here's the result, or the purpose actually, and with God that's the same as the result, by two unchangeable things which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have, would have, number one, we'd have encouragement. Number two, we'd have strong, not just encouragement, we'd have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters the, within the veil. Here's the key. Here's the key to why we do what we do. Be diligent. Well, why should I be diligent? Because God always, always, always keeps his word. And he made a promise. The promise is, if you diligently have faith in Jesus Christ, and you diligently obey me, that is the way you will be where I am. That's the way to get there. I've repeated this before. You need to look at it sometime on your own. Exodus chapter 6. Exodus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Moses, go back and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He goes back and Pharaoh says, no, I won't let him go. And he says, in fact, you're going to work more. And so Moses comes up to Pharaoh again, and in the meantime, the, the Israelite taskmasters, the Israelite foremen had gone in, and, and, and Pharaoh had said to them, you need to do more work. And when Moses goes to God next, he says, ever since you sent me, you haven't delivered what you said you would. And in Ephesians, excuse me, in Galatians, uh, Genesis, Exodus chapter 6, <laughs> Exodus chapter 6, God begins using this expression, I am the Lord. I am the Lord, three times, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And his point was, Moses had just said, you don't deliver on your promises. And God says, watch this. I am a God who does nothing else but deliver my promises. That is the faith that, that established the nation of Israel when it came out of Exodus. That's the same faith we need to have. Why do I do what God, what I, what I do? Because God made a promise. And that's it. I'll hang on to it. Because I know that he'll keep his word. He always does. The author's point in all this is to be diligent. If they hadn't known who Abraham was, would his point have made any sense to them? Or the illustration? The point would have made sense. But the illustration would not have. Who's Abraham? So what's the point? You've got to study your Old Testament. Romans 15, 4, the things that happened beforehand were written for our perseverance and encouragement. And if I may, the exhorter, that's what he calls himself. Well, that's what he calls it. Expected them to have familiarized themselves with the text before Christ. This might also be a point that like with like Paul Started with something that they knew, because if, 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 like you said, they, if you picked some other person, then they didn't know about him, it would have been nothing. So when you're, when you're talking to people, you got to start with what they know. Yeah. You gotta, because if we, if they don't even believe in God, and yet we start talking to them about the plan of salvation, it's not going to do us good. Yeah. Because I think this is that that. that. And and notice they needed a teacher. They needed. So there's some stuff in here that. What does this mean? In fact, I'm wrestling with the construction of one of these sentences in here, and I've written like five times. I can't figure this. I have the general idea, but what exactly is going on with this? I've written it five times this weekend. 
we, we, we all need somebody who can come up and say, look, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what he's doing there. So we, okay. <laughs> uh, who went first, Jonathan? The <coughs> exact construction happened to be 17 and 18? No. 18? Okay, well, stupid question for me then. No. This, this never made a bunch of sense to me. What do you think the two things are? This is exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what I was okay, so George will answer you. I take it to be the promise and the oath. His, he doesn't have to make an oath. This is the way I take it, and this is also the way most people take it. Okay, I, I don't take it that way. But but that's true. He promised that he cannot lie. Okay, that is also true. The way I take it is he made a promise, which is, in other words, he said something. And once he said something, there's, there's reason to believe him, number one. And he also, like men do, made an oath. There's reason to believe him, number two. That's the way I take it. Good. <coughs> Okay, good. Um, the, uh, I think the unchangeableness of his purpose. He had a consistent purpose that did not change, and he made an oath regarding it. Okay. So he says purpose and oath, or purpose and promise. Purpose and promise oath. That's what he says. Now, we can do this all day long. <laughs> this is one of those things where we're going to have to be content with, like I am in verse. No. My, to answer part of your question is, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. It is a really, really interesting combination of words. That's all I'll say. I get the idea. The idea is you need to have faith in Jesus Christ. But actually he doesn't say that. He says you need to realize the same full, uh, the, realize the full assurance until the hope uh, of hope until the end, which is different. Do you have a suggestion for what the... I, I mean, like, like you, I, I have the idea of what God says is going to... Right. It is the case, but the like the unchangeable unchangeability of the yep. and I don't know if it's just uh, how long I can remember in the recent history of the ESV I I haven't done the look anywhere else. I don't know if it's just a translation thing, but I'm always like the unchangeable unchangeability in the something something and oath is in there twice. It, it seems like there might be five or six or seven things. Right. Don't miss the point. Right? No, let's not we, we under we get the point. Right. It, it, God wanted to show us that we can trust him. That's sometimes you wish he would have just said that. Right? <laughs> but there you go. There's, there's one of those things. Okay. Um, somebody wrote the idea of seizure. That we would um, take hold. Verse 18. Take hold of. Reach out, grab it, hold it, hug it like you're never going to let go of it. Right? The idea of seizure implies a taking hold of and grasping in a resolute manner, which again stresses the supreme importance of the action. Hope is of such a character that it needs tenacity to retain it. It does not simply happen. It doesn't. Yeah, I had this hope, burning sensation in me. I understood the gospel. I realized it pricked me to the heart. And I realized, yes, I want to be with him, and Jesus Christ is the way, and that was 20 years ago, and now, you know, I just kind of, I don't have that same hope anymore. Why not? Is it because God's word has changed? Because God's changed? No, it's because I have not maintained, I have not been diligent about exercising my hope. How do we exercise, how do we diligently, it says, it's put in front of us. So how do we diligently make it our own? It's right here. Now you've got to make it your own. You've got to make that hope your own. How do we do it? Let me suggest this. I'm not answering it. The other day we talked about idols in the hearts of the elders in Ezekiel 14. And we asked the question, this is in the Thursday class, how did those idols get into their hearts? It's not literal. It's figurative. But how did they do it? How did those idols get set up in their hearts? Jonathan answered first last time. You got to answer first this time. He forgets. That's okay. It was Thursday night. They spend their time. That's what you do. How, how does anything become the love of your life? How does anything become the love of your life? You spend time with it. That's the only way. And when you stop spending time with it, 
it no longer, this is also a lesson about marriage too, isn't it, right? Right, but when you stop spending time with it, it step by step walks out of your heart or you push it out of your heart. So I gotta take hold of it. I want to love the Lord. I want to have this hope that is so strong in me. How do I get there? Bit by bit, every day, reading, praying, doing. Comments or questions on this? Kind of throws a hole in the whole Several. <laughs> yeah, what, what specifically are you thinking of? Just, just simply happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It doesn't just simply happen, right? To them it does, right? Right. 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 It simply happens. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back to this in just a second. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope, sure, steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, which is a reference to where? Heaven, where Jesus entered as a forerunner for us. Okay, so now we're back to Jesus and the high priest. Now we've come full circle from chapter 5, verse 9, okay? We're finally going to get back into what he wants to say. Jesus entered heaven as a forerunner before us. Okay, how do we know Jesus actually went to heaven? Or let me rephrase it. How did they know? How did they know that? I mean, they watched him ascend. But, you know, Enoch also ascended. Elijah also ascended. How do we know that Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of God? How do we know? How did they know? He tells us, how did they know? Back then, in Acts chapter 2, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They start talking in tongues. And Peter says, this is proof that the one you killed is the Lord sitting at the right hand of God. So here's the deal. The proof that Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God is the same proof, which was Acts chapter 2 and following, is the same proof that if we continue to be faithful, we will be right there with him. It's the exact same. Your hope is within the veil where Jesus Christ went. How do we know he went there? He sent back proof. Not only that impacts our belief in him, but the promise that he makes. You can be here with me too. Here's, here's evidence of it. And he gives them the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Comments or questions on that? I will say this really quickly. If, for example, Abraham, or us, Abraham, had had all the faith in the world, and God's word was not trustworthy, would that faith have saved him? Wouldn't it? Assuming God had lied. Or I know that's impossible since you died that lie. Right? I know that. But my point is this. Abraham could have all the faith in the world, but what did his salvation still depend on? The trustworthiness of God. Get that. Abraham's faith did not save him. God saw Abraham, who had faith, and he reached down and he saved him. Because faith is a condition of those whom God saves. But it is not the only condition. We have works that are done in obedience to him. Now some will say, you think that that work saves you. No, I don't. I do not. God, just like he reaches down and saves the one who has faith, that faith didn't save him. God reaching down grabbed the one who had faith and he saved him. The same with yeah. confession, repentance, baptism, and lifetime of obedience, right? It's the exact same thing. Comments or questions here? John? Having faith in doing works just makes God inclined to save us. Exactly. That's right. Mm -hmm. We've got eight minutes left. We can do it. 
Does anybody else have anything else from this? Uh, he does say, I'm sorry, I skipped this part. Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, and we've come full circle, and we're finally back to what the author really wanted to say in chapter 5, verse 10. I am done for now with chapters 5, 11 through 6, 20. Do any of you have something you'd like to add about that text? You can believe it. You better believe it. I'm going to skip the questions for chapter 7. Did, you, did you, anybody find Daddy. that difficult? Daddy. Did anybody find finding them difficult? Okay. Yeah. Chapter 7. <clears throat> chapter 7. We, we have this new section. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was first of all by translation of his name King of Righteousness, and then also King of Salem, which is King of Peace. So we have here an inspired recounting of the event and an exposition of the event. That his name Melchizedek means King of Righteousness. I don't know if you would have got that without him saying it. I don't think I would. So he exposes the text. This is class A, exhibit one, example of how to preach, right? You go back there, you get out of there what's in there. The king of righteousness, then also the king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, according to the record, right? Without genealogy, without either beginning of days or end of life, but made like the son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Understand. The weight of these first four verses, first four verses, is on this last part. He was made like the Son of God. Remember, that's what he wanted to say back there in chapter 5, verse 9. We want to tell you more about this relationship between Jesus and Melchizedek. He finally gets to it. Melchizedek was made like Jesus. Now, verses 4 through 10, an inspired comparison. He, he just exposed. Remember that guy back there? Well, let me tell you about him. Now he's going to get to the meat of his argument. Now observe, it's a command. You need to look at this. How great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choice of spoils. Who did a Jew put all of his faith in? Abraham or Moses. But then go back even further to Abraham. Don't you say that I'm a child of Abraham. God can raise up from these stones descendants of Abraham. Right? Exactly. They put all their faith in Abraham. And this author says, you remember Abraham? That great guy. The patriarch. It's emphatic. The patriarch. Guess who was greater than he was? Verse 5 and through, uh, was it 10? Now he's going to talk about the Levites who are obviously descendants of Abraham. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who receive of the priest's office have commanded in the law to collect the tenth of the people that is from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham, you remember the patriarch, and blessed the one who had the promises. Wait a minute, Abraham had all the promises. He's the great one. Verse 7, and here's the weight of this section. Without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithe, but in the case that one, in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithe, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Here's the argument. If Jesus is like Melchizedek, and he is, that's verse 3. And Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and Levi, and he is, that's 4 through 10. Then Jesus was greater than Abraham and Levi, and Jesus' priesthood is greater than the Levitical high priesthood. That's the argument, that's the point. That will shift us into chapter 7, 11 through 10, 18, which is a long, long discussion which says the Levitical priesthood could not make perfect. The law of Moses could not make perfect. The first covenant could not make perfect. The divine service and the temple could not make perfect. The animal sacrifices of the law of Moses could not make perfect. The only thing that makes perfect is Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, yeah. 
that's all I have to say, really, for 7 through 10, excuse me, chapter 7, 1 through 10, about the exposition of it. That will make this point. <laughs> Melchizedek was the king of peace and the king of righteousness. The author says, let's look, let's go back there, let's take a good, close look at Melchizedek. And who does he turn out to be? King of righteousness and king of peace. Now, I know his point is that's like Christ. But are we not, quote, unquote, kings? Right? We have crowns. We are a royal priesthood. I wonder if God looked at my life. If he examined it really closely, closely, he would look down and see a king of righteousness and a king of peace. Because that's who we're supposed to be. Right? Anybody else? Anything else from this? We'll, we'll take a brief look at it next week, but I don't have much else to say other than discussing permanence, the way he uses the text. Go ahead. This point is relatively shallow compared to what you have been pointing out. However, the... The fact is that he's dealing with people here who apparently have been saying Abraham, Abraham, Abraham their entire lives and for generations without actually thinking beyond just that initial impression. Oh, we've got Abraham. Well, Abraham wasn't even under the law of Moses. Yeah. You, you, you know, and, and, and we, I do that today. You know, I, I say something that I believe over and over again without exploring further, and we encounter people who who do that too. Yeah, yeah, this is, you know, the words themselves might actually be true, but when it comes to application, maybe they've not even gotten there at all. You know, it just, oh, we have Abraham. It becomes this habit without, without really the faith or the knowledge behind it to understand how, how you're supposed to take that and do something with it. Yeah. Because it was before them the whole time. It needed to be explained. Yeah. But, but anytime you look back to Abraham, somebody could have said, well, Abraham wasn't even under that law. So... Right. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else from this? I know you want to say No. <laughs> All right, we'll break there. It's uh, we'll break till right on the hour. We'll come back and look at it briefly next week before getting into chapter the rest of the chapter. Thank you for your work.